So welcome to ITS 323, Introduction to Data Communications. My name's Steve Gordon. I'll be teaching this course. Uh, this group of students, your IT students, we're going to have a few exchange students with us as well. Uh, a few more, they're all on holiday, I think, gone on a long weekend. Uh, we're going to try and give you your first course on communication systems and the internet and computer networks in general. In today's lecture, we have two, two parts. The first part, I'll try and give an example to try and introduce what we mean by communications and an example that you, you know about. So try and connect all the things you already know to uh, data communications and the internet. And then we'll have a break about 2.40, no, 2.20, have a break. And then after that, we'll get started really on the first lecture. So in the first hour or so, we will not be covering much from the lecture notes. I'll just show some examples on the screen. And when we get a bit of time, we may talk about the structure of the course, like the exams, the quizzes, the website, and other things. But not, not quite yet. Let's go straight to an example uh, of how you um, or to try and demonstrate some of the things that you already know about data communications, and in particular in using the internet. So a good example of using data communications is across the internet, which we use every day, and in particular web browsing we use every day. So let's access a website and see how it works. Because this course is trying to be how does data communications work? And a large part of that is how does the internet work? So we'd like to know how the internet works. So let's access a website and, and see what happens. Any recommendations of a website I should access? There's our course website. I'll not go to there. Let's try one. I'll try type in an, an address. Okay, good, it worked. I gave this to the Sears class on Wednesday and it didn't work. The internet didn't work. Welcome to ITS 323. I just accessed a web page. Okay, nothing complex. What we want to know is how did that work? What happened in that case? So let's just go back. It may be hard to see at the back. Um, can we zoom in a little bit? The first thing I did was typed in an address. And if you saw me, I typed in, it's not fully shown there, I typed in http colon slash slash sandylands.info slash it.html. What is that? What's the name of that thing? Again? What's the name of that domain? Part of it is a domain. So sandylands.info we call a domain. But the whole thing, http colon slash slash sandylands.info slash it.html is a URL. Okay, I think you may have heard of it. You may not know what it means, a uniform resource locator. But a URL is the whole address, and part of that address is the domain. The other part is the HTTP, and also this slash it.html is a file name. Okay. So the first thing that we do when we visit websites is usually we need to specify some address. And what we're going to study in this course is different, well, what we'll come across is different addressing schemes different ways that we uh, identify uh, devices using addresses and the role of those addresses in data communications. All right, so we type in an address, then what happened? I pressed enter. What happened? Download. Download. Browse. Browse, yeah. What? Correct? Okay, so I typed in an address and it browsed, uh, so I think you mean it, it showed me the web page. 
that this address identifies. So the address or URL identifies a resource. In this case, the resource is a web page, a file, a HTML file. Who knows HTML? Who can write HTML? Who has seen the inside of a HTML file? Okay, the, the HTML tags, the greater than, less than signs, and so on. Even if you can't remember the syntax, I think many people may have seen the, the inside of a HTML file. So what happened when I pressed enter is that my browser, this is my web browser on my laptop, my browser browsed to this website, but what does that mean? What did my browser actually do or my computer do? Did it communicate with someone else or some other entity? Where did this web page come from? Database, uh, possibly, maybe. But where, where does this web page come from? Did it just magically appear on my laptop? Where did it come from? Anyone want to guess? Did it come from America? Did it come from Thailand? Did it come from uh, my blue laptop? I don't know. Japan? Okay, maybe it did. <laughs> what, what can we d identify? Well, the address identifies a web server. Okay? Sandylands.info identifies is it the address of some web server. So with web browsing, the very simple view of web browsing is my browser I want to visit this web page. I tell my browser by typing in the address. I press enter. My browser and my computer sends a request to a web server. The web server is identified by sandylands.info. Sends a request to some web server somewhere in the world. The web server receives the request. The request is for the page or the file it.html. The web server receives a request, looks on its hard drive to see if it has that page. If it does, it sends that page back in a response. When my browser receives the response, then it displays this text on the screen. So there was some, some communications happening there. My browser sends a message to a web server somewhere on the internet. The web server sends a response back containing the web page. Then my browser displays that web page on the screen. It all happened quite fast. I think from when I pressed enter until it was displayed, it was, I guess, milliseconds, less than a second. So, what's the name of that mechanism? for my browser sending a request and then the server sending a reply. What's the name of that, that technique or mechanism? Query. A query, okay, so it's a request response. So it's a query for a web page. More specific, uh, there's a name, and you know the name, you may not know what it means, you see it every day. What, what's the name of the, the mechanism used for requesting and retrieving web pages. It's a protocol. Starts with H. HTTP. Okay. It's no longer displayed here. My browser is too smart to display it. it. But I typed in HTTP colon slash slash. HTTP hypertext transfer protocol. That is the mechanism for or well, the set of rules that define how my browser sends a request to the server and how the server sends a response. It's a protocol. The hypertext transfer protocol, it's a protocol for transferring hypertext. Hypertext is the name of the, the way for describing the format of web pages, HTML, the hypertext markup language. So we have a protocol that defines how to communicate. One of them that you always see is HTTP. Does anyone know any others in the internet? Other protocols you may have heard of? FTP, maybe you've downloaded files, FTP from a, a server. Others? Has anyone? 
you, maybe you, you, many people use web browsers to do everything nowadays, but uh, many other applications on the internet, email uses, sometimes you use something like POP or IMAP or SMTP. Um, when you had a, a, maybe a few years ago, you had MSN Messenger, okay? And that used its own protocol, an instant messaging protocol, to talk to other messenger instances. Uh, voice over IP allows you to make voice calls over the internet. VOIP, you may have seen the acronym. We'll see many acronyms which refer to protocols through this course. What's another one? IP, the internet protocol, is a core one. Okay, web browsing. Send a request for a page, the server sends back that web page. What's the web page look like? Uh, it's, we can view the page source, and for those experts in HTML, it doesn't matter if you can't read it. Um, you can zoom in a little bit. The HTML source of that web page saying the, ma the markup tags and welcome to ITS 323, the heading, and so on. So as a web developer, you would create this page, put it on the web server, then someone would visit your website and they would see the, the content from this HTML page. Very simple so far. Where is the web server? Tokyo, okay. How do we know that? I know it because it's my web server. It's in Tokyo, Japan. That's why I wrote it here. Okay? Uh, don't worry about how we know that. We know it in this case. Uh, so, it's in Japan. My browser's here in Thailand. So the request went all the way to Japan and then came back. And how long did it take? Uh, if I reload, can someone time, get their stopwatch going? Okay, less than a second. Okay, so to get all the way to Japan, and come back, the server to respond takes milliseconds in that case. What else do we know about this? So we s there are addresses that identify resources or computers, like a domain name identifies a web server, a URL identifies a file on a web server. We have protocols that define how we communicate between computers, like HTTP. Uh, what else can we see from this simple example of web browsing? Other types of addresses. Does anyone know of other types of addresses? Does my laptop have an address? Do you think? Yes? Does my laptop, do you think, have a domain name? Like steveslaptop.com? Unlikely. Does yours, your mobile phone, have a domain? What's your domain? It has an address, and maybe it does have a name, but it may be local to a network. Yeah. But what, what address does your phone, tablet, laptop, home computer have? That I think you've seen, you may not understand what it means, but you've heard of it before. What type of address? An IP address. Okay, you may not have done much with it, but you, if you look in the settings on your phone you, about the network settings, you'll see something like an IP address. So an IP address is a, another type of address that identifies computers on the internet. And it's a very important address. In the simple terms, we'll assume that all computers on the internet have a unique IP address. So my laptop has an IP address. This blue laptop has a different IP address. The web server has one, and all other computers have a unique IP address. And we'll communicate by sending to a particular IP address. So I think you've heard of, you've definitely used HTTP, you've seen domain names, you know URLs, you've seen websites for sure, you've probably seen or, or come across IP addresses. What else? Uh, what's the IP address of my laptop? Anyone? Let's have a look. On my laptop, to see the IP address, it's my network interface. IF is short for interface. So to 
see the configuration of my interface, my wireless LAN interface, I use this command, you don't have to know the command, and I see a lot of information, and I see this is, I know that's the IP address for my laptop at this point in time, 10.10.99.159. Okay. What does it mean? We'll have a topic on the structure of IP addresses after the midterm. I'm sure you can look into your, your mobile phone and, and explore the network settings. If you go into the advanced settings, you'll find your IP address there okay, on any of your computing devices when you have internet access. Another IP address, what did I access? Sandylands.info. Sandylands.info is the domain name of my web server. My web server is a computer in Japan. This program will show me that that domain name also corresponds to an IP address. 106.187.46.22 So most servers have a domain name as well as an IP address. Computers use IP addresses to communicate. Humans remember domain names. So we'll talk about later, towards the end of the course, the mapping from domain names to IP addresses and how that works. Called DNS, the domain name system. I'm just trying to go through a very simple example of web browsing and trying to highlight some things you already know or come across about data communications. Let's see what else we can see. Uh, So I said with HTTP, my browser sent a request to the web server. The server sent back a reply. I tried to draw this before. Uh, so we have a browser and some server, so two computers somewhere on the internet. And will say that the browser and server connected via something called the internet. I'll draw it as a cloud, meaning well, it's much more complex than just a cloud. It's actually many different devices. Don't worry too much about drawing my pictures. You'll, they're not uh, so important at this stage. Uh, after our break, we'll move on to the first lecture notes and we'll try and cover the same concepts but it may be in a little bit more formal manner. And then you can take more notes. What happens? Um, if I can draw it, what happens? The browser sends some request to the server. Just write it that as a request. And then the server gets the web page and sends back a response. And this is part of the protocol called HTTP. So HTTP defines the format of the request, the format of the response, when to send them, what should be inside the, those messages. That's a protocol. What else do we see? When, when I accessed that website, I was doing something else on my computer. I was recording the messages that my computer sent and received. Okay. So just before I accessed the website, I, I started another piece of software to record everything that my computer, where the browser's running, every message it sends and receives. Let's have a look at those messages. I have to bring them up. Uh, 
and I'll go directly to hopefully and just to hide some of the details what was I? 106. Dot. You don't need to understand what I'm doing here but we'll just look at the final result if it works. A lot of detail here but this software shows a record of the messages that my computer sent and received. So I started some recording. So everything that came out of my computer and went into my computer across the wireless interface was recorded and I've summarized and selected the two things of importance in these two messages. The, the top, these two show the two messages. A lot of information here, let's just focus on some things that we know. There's a source address and a destination address. The source is who sent it, the destination is where is it going to. They are IP addresses. And if you can recall, 10.10.99.159 was my laptop and the 106 address was my server. So this first message went from my laptop to the web server using protocol HTTP. And the, the summary information in that message was the request, this is the request going to the server saying, I want to get the file called slash it.html. So this is my computer saying, I want to get this file. The length of that message was 366 bytes. And then, how long did it take to get the response back? So the next message is the response. How long does it take? Well, if you note here, there's some times. Rel relative to when I started this process, the time when the request was sent was 13.96 seconds. When the response came back, it was 14.27 seconds. So what's that? About uh, 0.3 seconds. About 300 milliseconds from when my browser sent the request to Japan and until the Japanese web server sent the web page back. So that's the, the time it takes to get the response back from this information. It's from the web server to my laptop. You're still using HTTP and the response, some summary information is saying everything's okay. The request was okay and the response is okay. Most important, the response, here we can zoom in on some of the detail, inside the response is this. What is this? HTML, it's the web page. Okay, so this is the response message. Inside that response is the actual web page that I requested, the file it.html. So what happens is my browser sends the first request out, server receives the request, finds the file I requested, puts it in the response, sends the response back to my computer, my browser receives the response, grabs this part of it, and uses that to display on the screen, welcome to ITS2. 323. In this course, what we want to get to towards the end of the semester is how some of these other things work. HTTP, Transmission Control Protocol, TCP, the Internet Protocol, Ethernet, and other communication technologies. We want to study how they work. How big was the response? Here, 743 bytes. Uh, what else can we determine? I'll close that one for now. Let's have a look at the web page. I'm going to, I'm going to save this web page on my hard disk and we'll look at the size and look at the contents. Save it, I'll just save it as it.html. The page, the HTML page is 311 bytes. Okay. The response was 700 bytes. It contained the web, pa web page plus some other stuff, some overhead. But the page itself is 311 bytes. Why? 
why is it 311 bytes? All right, well, why 311? What, what does it tell you about what's inside? Anyone want to? Okay, there are 311 bytes of data. Uh, it's a hard, it's a confusing question. There's no one answer. Uh, it tells us, in fact, that there are probably 311 characters inside there. In the file itself, it's just a text file. If we look at that file, and you go and count all the characters in there, including the end of lines, you'll see that there are 311 characters there. Okay. Each character is stored on disk as a single byte, which is very common for most operating systems. Uh, we can word count that file. Word count. There are 13 lines, 39 words, 311 characters. Each character represents one byte. It was represented by one byte. Very basics we're doing, nothing exciting yet. Let's look at that file in the binary form. XXD is just a program to look at a file, a text file, in a binary form. I have to zoom out a little bit so it, it will fit on the screen. So this, on the right hand side, it shows the ASCII representation. I just gave you the answer to my next question. Uh, it shows some, the text, and here is the binary form. Okay. Well, my next question was, how do we map text to binary? ASCII is the common encoding that we use. You know, the ASCII table says that the, the letter H is the number 104 or whatever it is, which corresponds to a 7-bit value, but on the hard disk we store as an 8-bit value. So the letter H here in HTML is this binary number. So we can map any form of text into binary. And later as we go through data communications, in most of the things that we want to communicate, we'll represent them as binary and deal with how to send bits across some link or network. Uh, last thing with respect to our example. I said that I sent from here my laptop in Thailand to the server in Japan. So I told you it's in Japan. Which path did it take? How did it get to Japan from Thailand? Anyone want to guess? Where did it go outside of, think of cities or, or, or countries that it may have went via to get to Japan? What we'd like to know sometimes is, okay, all right, first question, do I have a cable going from my laptop to the server in Japan? No, there's no cable from my laptop into the server. I don't have a direct connection. I send the data via other locations, via other devices. In fact, where's the first thing that I sent the message, the request message via? This laptop sent a request message to where? Even before a server in Thailand, something much closer. Maybe you can see it. Right, that thing on the wall up there. Okay, the wireless, the first thing, because I was using, using Wi-Fi on my laptop, the first thing it does is it sends a radio signal out of the laptop and it's received by this wireless access point, a wireless router on the wall. Okay, so that first step is that wireless communications. Then this one, it's hard to see, but there's a cable going out of the back and it goes up into the ceiling, down the wall, into the... Uh, I think into the third floor. There's a computer center into another device and it keeps going to another device and another device until it gets to the server in Tokyo via different devices. I haven't checked today but uh, when I tried this at home um, 
I found the path that it takes, or roughly the path. It may be a little bit different if I did it today, but when I tried it before, I found the path, and I'll try and bring it up. Uh, the path, this was actually from home, not from SIT, but it, it's almost the same. From the web browser to the server, where did it go via this message? And it actually goes via different companies' networks, or different organizations' networks. Those organizations are referred to as usually internet service providers, ISPs or telecom companies. So in this case, actually from home, it went, because my ISP at home is TOT. TOT is the local uh, government telco in Thailand. And they are an ISP. So it went to TOT's network. Some devices inside there. So not just a particular device, but this represents their that company's network. And then it went to another device or another network of TOT called the TOT International Internet Gateway, IIG. And the way the internet structured in Thailand is that there are many ISPs that you can subscribe to. You pay monthly to access. And most of them then connect into five or six different international gateways inside the country. And then those international gateways connect to ISPs in other countries. And in my case, the data went to the TOT International Internet Gateway, which had a connection to NT&T, actually a Japanese company, in Singapore. So it went from Bangkok to Singapore. And then it went via Singapore to Japan probably into Tokyo, I don't know. NTT is the other company, it's the national telecom company of Japan. Then it went to another telecom company or ISP in Japan called KDDI. And then it went to the company that hosts the web server called Linode, just the, the company that I pay per month for this server. So that's the rough path between the browser and the server that the data took. If you do it again today, from my laptop, it may be different. Okay. If you access a server in the US or in Europe or in some other region, the path will be different. One of our topics or several of our topics will look at how do we find a good path between browser and server or generally between two computers in a network. And it's called routing. How do we find a route from source to destination? That will be a topic that we cover after the midterm. Any questions so far? Nothing much new. Uh, just some basics of how web browsing works and a little bit about the internet structure. Come back to this international internet gateway. Maybe more detail, what does the internet in Thailand look like? Anyone seen a picture of the internet in Thailand? Or the structure of the internet? I'm sure you've seen one. I think most people here have seen a picture of the internet in Thailand. Let's see if I can bring one up. Uh, Thailand International Internet Gateway, a map of the international connections from Thailand to other countries. I think everyone's seen that. It's on the front page of your handout, of your booklet. It's hard to see both on the screen and also in the black and white version on your handout. It's probably best to see on your own computer so you can zoom in and find the information. Uh, but the general structure is that these blue ones in the center are the international internet gateways. This is TOT IIG here, the one that we connected to, but there are a few others. The gray ones around the outside are ISPs in other countries. 
the blue ones are some special ISPs inside Thailand and all the lines are the links, the communication links between all those organizations. We'll just zoom in on, on some small parts. And again, this is where you need to look in on your own computer. So one of the bigger gateways is run by CAT, C-A-T, one of the, the government-based telecom companies here. And these are international ISPs or companies overseas which connect into the CAT, IIG and other international gateways. You can notice the maybe you'll recognize the names of some companies or ISPs, the countries Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, Google from Malaysia and Singapore. So Google has their own links into the Thailand. So when you access Google services, including YouTube, instead of going to the servers in the US, it can go direct to the servers nearby in Singapore, Hong, uh, Malaysia and so on. And you can scroll around best in your own time to see many other companies there. Mostly around Asia, some in the US, uh, and so on. And the, li the lines are the links. So think of them almost, they're not always, but most of them are cables. And the numbers specify the speed that we can transfer the data between those two entities. For example, KDDI in Hong Kong, there's this red line going somewhere and the speed of that link is one gigabit per second. That's what the 1G means here, one gigabit per second. So you can see the speeds of different links of the connectivity inside the country. Again, in this course we want to study things about the speed, what technologies give us different speeds, the connectivity between what technologies we'll use to communicate between these entities, uh, and a few other things about the structure of the internet. You can find this, this map from some website. I'll, I think I'll add a link to the course website. Uh, you'll search, if you search for Thailand internet map, you'll find it, I'm pretty sure, run by Nectech. So they've got an international map showing connections to other ISPs and an internal map, how the internal ISPs connect inside the country updated quite often. Last, last thing. If we zoom in on our communications from my laptop to the server in Japan and just look at the, the portion inside this campus, it looks roughly like this. Here's my laptop. Okay. It communicates with this wireless access point on the wall. There's no link. There's no cable there. There's a link, but no physical cable. We use wireless communications there. So I send some radio signal to this access point. It's got the antennas that pick up the signal. The access point then has a cable going up through the wall and it goes down into what's called a switch in, I think in the third floor, there's a small computer center there. And eventually it goes out to something called a gateway for this campus, which connects this campus to the rest of the world with respect to the internet. It's a gateway between our network inside the campus to all the other networks out on the internet. So the gateway at Bunker D, and that actually has a link going to Rungsit. If I think we have at least two links. One of them is a wireless link. If you go to the top of uh, the other building, there's an antenna up there that points at Rungsit, and we have a wireless link, but we also have a wired link that we use to connect to the other campus. So this just draws the internal campus communications. So another part of this topic is about how do the communications inside a LAN work? A wireless or a wired LAN, a local area network. And we'll look at some of the techniques there. 
So there's our introduction to the course and some of the things that we'll try and cover in this course. How internet applications like web browsing work, how the internet is structured. And this is almost going backwards. Towards the end we'll look at the applications, before that we'll look at the internet structure, and then before that we'll look at LANs, how do we connect across a local area network, and how do we connect, say, between countries, a wide area network, or WANs. And before that, we'll look at things about how to find a route from source to destination, how to find a path. Before that, we need to look at the details of just a single link. Say, from access point to switch over one cable, how do we get data across a cable? What do we do? How do we send, just imagine here to the switch, what do we send? Send a signal. What shape? Up, down, up, down. All right, some, we could send some signal in general. Yes, correct. We send some signal across this link where that signal represents the information. The information is usually bits. Okay? Whether it's a web page, an email, a video, we'll often look at digital data. Sometimes we'll look at analog, but if we have bits, we map those bits of information to a signal, whether it's a digital signal like square wave or an analog signal, think of a sine wave. We send some signal across here such that that represents the information being communicated. The receiver receives the signal and interprets what that information was. So we'll actually spend the first part of this course looking at those signals defining what they are, how we encode data on those signals, and how to do it efficiently. Let's stop there, at least on this introduction part. Any questions? Everyone's confident they're going to be successful in this course? They know what it's about? It's about how do we communicate first across links, and then how do we communicate across networks, including the internet. This course, or data communications, is a rather complex and large topic. This is just the introduction to data communications. Those that stick around past this semester, next semester that you have a course on computer computer networks and network architectures, I think it's called, ITS 327, that sort of extends or continues on from this course. Here we just do the basics. In the next course taught by Dr. Comwood, we'll be more detailed about the internet and some networks. Next semester also, we'll do a lab. So we'll do some hands-on with what we learn in this course and a little bit from the ITS 327. So I will teach the lab next semester. So IT program. Another aspect of the internet and data communications is security. How do we make sure our communications are secure? So next semester we also have an, a, a course called IT security that I think all of you will take and I will teach you that as well. Okay. Some of you may choose the ICT option inside IT. So you may get some more details about communications. There's teleservices and services architectures internet technologies and applications. Usually they are taught by adjuncts or, or external people, so the topics change a little bit, but related to the internet and telecommunications, and maybe even mobile computing next year. So it's important that you're successful in this course so that you can be successful in the subsequent courses. Okay? So make sure you get through this course so that you can find the next course is much easier.